This show is brought to you by Anchor.fm. Anchor is the easiest way to make podcasts. It's free. There are tools for you to record and edit your podcast from your phone on web. Anchor also helps you to distribute your podcast to Spotify, Apple Podcasts and likes. You can also monetize your podcast with minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Welcome to TC 39ers. I'm Hemant, your host. And with us today, we have an interesting guest who works at a cooperative called Egalia, who are into uh, implementation of uh, JavaScript specification, um, node, browsers, and all of it, all of the interesting stuff. And he is interested in effective, expressive programming languages, of course, works on TC39 and is improving JavaScript. We have none other than Daniel Ellenberg. Welcome to the show, Daniel. Hello, thanks for having me here. It's an amazing feeling to have you here on the show. Um, as we always start the show with the journey of the, the guest, uh, we would definitely like to know about what brought you into the software industry and what keeps you going. Oh, yeah. So when I was in, uh, I guess, late middle school, early high school, I was trying to learn how to program. And I was reading about different programming languages online, like Python or, or Haskell or, or JavaScript. And I kept getting annoyed. They all seemed like they were too inconsistent. Eventually, I found a, a very obscure esoteric programming language called Factor and spent the next several years uh, you know, working in the Factor community. Factor is a language that's kind of like fourth, kind of like Lisp put together. It's a stack-based programming language. So you, you write your code in postfix order. So to, like to add two numbers, you do like one, two, plus. First, you push them onto the stack, and then you add them. Mm -hmm. I really loved how Factor was very, it was like limitless and completely expressive. You could do whatever you want. And you can make your own new syntax. Like I made syntax for XML, we made different libraries. Um, and uh, eventually after on Factor and having that not, not become very popular uh, or, or useful or anything, <laughs> I got mm -hmm. kind of demotivated. And when I graduated college, I started working for, for Google on some uh, kind of driver projects, like Linux kernel things. Mm -hmm. um, after, after four years of that, I saw an internal transfer opportunity to move to the V8 team to work on the language sub team, going to TC39 and implementing ES6 and async await and those sorts of things. And so I, so I took that transfer. And... After working there for, for a bit, I ended up working in, in Egalia, which allowed me to put an even stronger focus on on TC39 and on, on language improvements. That That's amazing. So, so your daily job is to improve the language, if I were to put it in that way. Uh, yeah, my my job is, you know, part partly working on TC39 proposals, partly talking to you know, kind of mentoring other people in my team in Egalia and, and outside of Egalia in, in making these improvements. Uh, we're, we're consultancies, so I also work on sales to, to you know, persuade potential sponsors to, to you know, support our work. And uh, that, that kind of thing. That's amazing. We also had uh, one of your co colleagues, Ujwal, on the show previously, too. Yeah, Ujwal has been great to work with. I'm happy he's he's in Egalia. Um, but we have a number of people in Egalia who work on TC39, as well as other web standards. Like, we're working on bringing MathML back to Chromium, or CSS Grid and CSS Containment. Mm -hmm. uh, or, sorry, CSS, in, in addition to those, also CSS container queries hmm. so you can resize or re restyle things based on how wide the container is not just how wide the whole viewport is and so we're we're really interested in pushing the web forward and finding a, a multilateral funding model for that that's amazing all the job you folks are doing is amazing um well thank you <laughs> 
So, uh, so for the next uh, section, I have this uh, interesting question on the TC39 stages. Uh, if you could explain the TC39 stages to a five-year-old, how would you do that? <laughs> to a five-year-old? Yeah. Uh, well, um, so we have this four-stage process. So in TC39, we're trying to change JavaScript and we we develop we develop the changes we don't say okay javascript is this one way and all of a sudden it's this other way we have intermediate steps because it takes time to to develop and iterate on a change so when somebody in the committee in the group of people that that works on javascript when they want to make a change they present an initial idea to committee and if if the committee is interested in discussing it further, it's a very low bar, then the proposal can go to stage one. So it's kind of just talking about a problem. When something's in stage one, it's on the table for discussion, but the committee has not really agreed to any particular solution and it, it really still might not happen. Once there's a concrete solution, a really concrete change to the language, um, and this requires that there's a, um, we, we, we work by iteratively making documents and, and implementations more detailed. So for stage one, we ask that there be a, a readme that describes basically like what the feature is and what, what it's doing. Mm -hmm. For stage two, we require that this readme be, be quite kind of detailed and expressive not just saying what it's trying to do, but really giving some some like code samples. And in addition to that, the, there should be a draft specification. The specification is more detailed than just giving some examples. It describes exactly how the feature works. And it doesn't have to be the final specification because we'll still be editing that over later stages. Stage three means the, uh, the solution is really complete. We have agreement as a committee on the, the shape of the solution and on the exact form of the specification. And it's past review from the TC39 editors, as well as some other committee members who sign up as reviewers. By the time something gets to stage three, we have a strong signal of stability from the committee. The committee is saying, you know, this, this really is it. This is, this is as far as we can go until we implement it. Most, most stage three features do tend to have some implementations already. For example, implementations in, in Babel or other transpilers mm -hmm. so that people can try out the feature. Or if it's a library, they usually have a polyfill. Right. And these sort of simpler, higher level implementations are really useful to get design feedback. Mm. After stage three, we try to actually implement these features in more like native JavaScript engines, hmm. like V8 or SpiderMonkey or JSC. Right. Because the committee has uh, talked about this feature for a while, it's gotten to a level of stability that can lead to confidence in these implementations that the feature is going to move forward unless some, some huge problem is discovered later. Hmm. And web browsers and Node.js and other JavaScript environments often ship new JavaScript features to users right. during stage three hmm. because it's it's gotten this mark of stability. And once we have multiple implementations, uh, which usually means multiple web browsers shipping the feature, then we can go to stage four, which means that the, the feature is complete uh, it's, it has these multiple compatible mm -hmm. things and it's going to be shipped in web browsers and it, it's, and it's shipping in browsers and, and just everywhere. It's just part of the language. At that point at stage four, we merge the, we have a, a pull request that merges it into the main specification mm -hmm. as, as a condition of stage four. And then at stage four, after stage four, the pull request can be merged. 
So I don't I don't think that explanation was understandable for a five year old. Yeah. Uh, at 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 a high level, at stage one, we have a high level idea under discussion. Mm-hmm. At stage two, we have an initial concrete idea right. that we agree we want to move forward. Mm-hmm. At stage three, we have this final solution to the to the problem. Right. Uh, we've designed the solution, and at stage four, we have multiple implementations, conformance tests. And it's shipping, and it's standard. Awesome! Thank you so much for summarizing that. And I and I definitely understand it's not an easy task to explain this to a five-year-old. But that was just a fun question. But definitely, that would have helped all of our listeners to you know kind of refresh uh, on on stages and you know, to get an uh, insight on how all of this works. Um, on on the contrast, do you feel uh, sometimes folks tend to uh, use some of the state zero or one uh, plugins, say Babel plugins or polyfills, and probably might ship to prod, and they think, okay, this is a cool feature, and I'm going to use it, and it's still like in stage one or two, and folks are still discussing on how it would evolve is is not clear, and we don't know where it's heading towards. But uh, do you do you fear that uh, some some folks might do that or how how we could probably uh, you know educate people from not doing that well i think it's okay to ship code to prod as long as you're what it what it means is it's not that the uh your website is not going to suddenly break unless you change to a different version of, of babel or something like this mm-hmm. what it means is it's it's not like uh, calling an API where the, the other endpoint of the API might might break out from under you because when you when you use one of these new features you're using it with a transpiler or polyfill that has the actual implementation so it's the cost is more of a software maintenance cost you're you're tying your code base as your code base evolves and as you use new versions of tooling right. you're you're exposing yourself to this instability where if a feature is not yet stage three, it's it's quite likely that the feature will change or just not even move forward mm. at all, mm. and that significant migration costs will be needed. After stage three, there's really a high, there's a very strong track record of stability, right? And I think it's generally safe to rely on those features, even if you expect to be to be maintaining that code base for longer. But uh, people develop software in all kinds of different ways, and not not everything needs to prioritize mm-hmm. low future maintenance costs as the highest as the highest need. So uh, the the important thing is that it's an informed risk that developers are taking. Definitely, that's the key. That it's an informed risk. Awesome. And for the next question, uh, of course, we spoke about your interest in. Um, educating folks on uh, say tc13 on javascript and, and specification in general uh, we did we did notice that you started uh, the outreach program can we talk more about the tc39 outreach program what is it all about uh yeah so there there's a lot of people who come to the tc39 meetings who are delegates of member organizations or or invited experts uh, but really, that does not reach the whole JavaScript community. There's there's a lot of different kinds of outreach that that we try to do in in the committee. One one kind is we have a TC39 discourse, which you can go to uh, at um, uh, it's it's linked from the from the TC39 uh, website. If you go to tc39.es, you find a link to to our discourse, mm-hmm. and that's a place that you can write in ideas or questions. We also have a public matrix channel, um, which is which is linked from the website. And in addition to that, I've been running some uh, calls, some like monthly, uh, you know, Google video chat calls with different kinds of stakeholders in the ecosystem, like people who work on frameworks or, or tools. There's also a group working on improving educational materials. And in this way, we can bring in certain certain kind of key stakeholders to uh, have detailed conversations and influence the language in, in a way that just didn't seem quite possible on those asynchronous mechanisms. Because it can be mm-hmm. 
can provide a a more interactive way. We the outreach groups initiative is not really at the final state. It it hasn't really met all of its goals. I think mm-hmm. I would really like to build stronger mechanisms for being in touch with the broader JavaScript community of of all developers. But that's quite <laughs> that's quite a broad goal. Right. And you know, get in touch with me if you're if you're interested in in working on that more. It's not it's not clear to me exactly what medium is best. They're just different trade offs for different ways of being in communication. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, there, there's also trade offs about like letting the focus be proposals that the committee is actively working on versus open ended ideas and and different different efforts tend to focus on different parts. Like our discourse is more focused on these, these open-ended uh, sort of new ideas, whereas these outreach group calls are more focused on reviewing the TC39 agenda. And right. really there should be discussion space for, for both, but it's just, it's quite hard to facilitate those discussions. So I, <laughs> there's a lot of room for improvement still. I absolutely agree. And thanks to you, I'm also part of the outreach program now. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm I'm very happy about what you all are doing in the in the education outreach program. Yeah. Uh building new new articles to, to introduce people to proposals and uh and the and the process and all those things. And this this um you know, this podcast though it wasn't, you know, an initiative of that really ties in well to the, the same kinds of goals. I'm very happy that you that you've been doing this. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um so getting back to the proposals and spec on on, on, on such lines, um, I would definitely like to hear more about decimals and operating overloading. Do, does JavaScript really need operating overloading? And I, I, it does look that it gels well with decimal. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, so, you know, historically JavaScript had numbers as the only numeric type, uh, but numbers are not so great. Numbers are these double precision, so 64-bit binary floating point numbers. So they're they're just ones and zeros. So for example, there's no accurate way to represent 0.1 because 0.1 in a binary decimal, in a binary fraction, uh, is repeating. It's like one third hmm. is, it's like three is going forever. 0.1 in floats is like that. So you have to round it. Right. That's, that's really unfortunate. Uh, and it causes bugs in real programs. So what, what we've done so far in TC39 is we've created BigInt for, to solve a certain class of these bugs. BigInt can accurately represent any integer, no matter how big is it, it is, as long as it you know fits in the, in the computer. <laughs> so we're, <laughs> we're still working on finite computers, but you know, the, the limits that JavaScript had were, were much smaller than that because it was only what could be represented in these 64 bits. Right. Or for integers, actually 53 bits because because you need some floating point numbers have the exponent and the mantissa or the fraction. Mm. And some of those bits were needed for the exponent to, to say like what the order of magnitude is. So you only have 53 bits of actual precision. Mm. And that's just not enough for all applications. Right. Uh, however, self, including integers is only half the story. Because if you want to represent money, well, you can represent that as an integer number of cents, but that's that's a rather incomplete solution, and it's and it's very error prone. Mm-hmm. I think it would be best if JavaScript developers could represent money or other kind of human decimal quantities in a, in a data type that represents what they are directly. So I think it would be really great if we had a built-in decimal type in JavaScript. And so this proposal, decimal, is at stage one in DC39. And I've been working on it with uh, with Kaio Lima in Igalia to to advance it forward. There is a couple different alternatives for what the data model could be for decimal. And if you want to learn more, I recommend that you uh, go to the DC39 proposal decimal or um, I mean, you can search for one of one of the talks that that I've given about decimal in the past. Um, operator overloading is this effort to generalize decimal and big end. 
So mm -hmm. Big Int has this property where you can add two Big Ints with plus and it just works. And I think decimal should be like that as well. We could make it all based on methods. So we could say, well, if you have two Big Ints, then you do, or two decimals, then you like decimal dot plus mm -hmm. of another. But at some point, requiring such uh, unintuitive syntax, you, you your intuition would be that you can just use plus, right? Yep. Re requiring this unintuitive syntax risks that people just convert the decimal to a number, mm -hmm. do plus on them, and then convert the result back to a decimal. We see these bugs in the wild all the time in Java code bases that yep. try to use big decimal. And so I think it's I think it's quite important that we don't reproduce that. We're we're really trying to make a high level intuitive language of JavaScript. I mean, it, it is a mm -hmm. high level language. Mm -hmm. So it should it should use operators when you're operating on numeric quantities. So there are two ways to go. We could either just allow operator overloading for these built-in numeric types, or we could allow general user-defined operator overloading. I don't really know which is better. There's definite complexity added for user-defined operator overloading. Um, it would it would be somewhat complicated to design and implement. Actually, GraalVM recently has created an implementation of operator overloading nice. because they're also interested in, in decimal and JavaScript. And uh, it's a little bit different from the operator overloading proposal that I wrote up, uh, mm -hmm. but it's a really interesting point in the design space. And I really hope that we can that we can find a good solution for these for these problems because we're going to want to use operators on more than just numbers and, and big end. Mm -hmm. I so I don't know whether we should allow general operator overloading or should right. just continue with big end's pattern of doing a one off extra case. There there are pros and cons to both. So I hope over the next year we can advance this discussion and figure out what what we want to happen to enable decimal in JavaScript. Awesome. Definitely. De decimal is, is definitely a good addition. And as you mentioned, the operating overloading, should it be just part of the decimal or should it be like at the global level is definitely debatable and, and hope we'll all get into consensus uh, in the coming years. Yes, consensus is the key because it seems like everybody wants decimal of some kind, but there's lots of different points of view about whether it should be in the context of operator overloading or not, and what the data model of decimal should be, if it should be big decimal or decimal 128. And these are quite valid debates. There are really reasonable arguments on both sides. And in, in TC39, we, we talk through these arguments until we can come to, to consensus on a solution. Definitely. Um, the the other uh, interesting proposal, and most of the folks would uh, talk to me or uh, we see these discussions happening on Twitter and likes is uh, decorators. And we do see that uh, TypeScript and likes have, have uh, implementation of decorators, which might not be uh, in sync with what the proposal is speaking today. Uh, would like to hear your thoughts on um, decorators. Yeah, decorators has been quite a long running proposal. Uh, it's, you know, it was proposed, it was raised in committee even before ES6 was fully standardized. So ES6, or ES 2015, added classes, but quite a restricted form of classes. It didn't have the, the class fields that now we have standardized at stage four in TC39. Yep. It didn't have any notion of privacy. And it didn't have any notion of classes being programmable or, or metadata being attached to classes. Hmm. All three of these things are really important to, to be able to do useful, common object-oriented programming patterns. And we have plenty of examples of all three of those used in, you know, supported in other programming languages in different ways. There are, now, now that we have privacy and fields under our belt in JavaScript, I really think it's time that we make progress on, on decorators. Because without decorators, you need to resort to other patterns besides classes. So mm -hmm. to explain what I mean about that, um, what you see in what you see in web frameworks these days, or, or at least the, like the previous generation of web frameworks, 
used a pattern of big object literals that you pass into a constructor. I think view still view view uses this pattern and, and it can be quite ergonomic. You can have these object literals that that encode uh, that have different properties for different things that are that are going on, and this can return to you a component. With decorators, in theory, you could use a class declaration mm -hmm. and use decorators in appropriate places to note um, to, to note, for example, what is a reactive property mm -hmm. or, or, you know, what name you're declaring the element to be. There, there are many different use cases for decorators. Basically decorators make classes programmable. Right. So there are two fundamental approaches for decorators. One approach is that decorators are metadata that are attached to the, to the class and then later something can read the metadata. And this is what Java annotations do. Mm -hmm. And the other approach is that decorators can be more, uh, more like co code or logic that executes when the class definition runs. And this is how decorators work in Python. Yep. In some way, the, the second form is more general because you can kind of express metadata in terms of in terms of uh, this imperative code that runs and modifies the classes. So there was a very large debate around the time of 2014, 2015 about this metadata versus imperative decorators and the imperative approach where code runs uh, was selected by, by Yehuda Katz and, and Ron Buckton and others who worked on decorators. So mm -hmm. following that, Decorators were implemented in Babel and TypeScript in similar but but slightly different ways. And the form of decorators from that period of time is the kind that most people are still using today. Even though the current draft of the decorators proposal differs from that, I recommend that people stick with these, you know, legacy or experimental decorators forms for a little bit longer until we get decorators to stage three, unless you're writing quite experimental code. Mm -hmm. So uh, you might have seen the news that just just yesterday, actually, the new decorators proposal specification and explainer was yep. uh, was posted, mm -hmm. and that's really exciting. So, I I worked on a number of drafts of the decorators proposal, but over the past year, the work has really been led led by by others, including uh, Zurak Zurak from the from the ember community who's really been running this this subgroup of multiple tc39 members and and other community members in terms of building a, a decorators proposal that meets everyone's needs there are many different constraints that came from many different sides about how decorators should work both from the implementation side to make sure that decorators don't make classes slow as well as from the use cases to make sure that various different use cases are, are represented and from tooling to make sure that decorators would be not too difficult to implement in the tooling pipelines that that most of you use today. So I'm pretty optimistic that over the next few months, we'll see greater review and prototyping of this new proposal. I encourage you to, to read it. It's at you know, github.com slash tc39 slash proposal decorators. That's where you could find the, the readme mm -hmm. and file issues if you have any feedback on the proposal. Awesome. It's it's really nice to see how, how, how it all started, as you mentioned, in ES6, because classes were just like syntactic sugars. And today we have so many other capabilities and, and, and JavaScript expanding itself in the object orientation as well as being very much capable on the functional aspect of it. It's, it's it's an interesting time to be. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned the, the syntactic sugar. I mean, ES6 classes do have some capabilities that go a little bit beyond syntactic sugar. Mm. At the same time, a core design goal of this decorators approach is that it is efficiently transpilable. So a requirement in effect is that it remains syntactic sugar, that we're just mm -hmm. adding more more sugar that could be desugared or translated or transpiled mm -hmm. to the older versions of JavaScript while making that work well. If it if we had a version of decorators that became slow when transpiled, that would not meet the project's goals. 
definitely and, and do not break the web has always been the motto <laughs> yeah at some point that's the easy part because to not break the web when we have decorators all we need to do is make sure that it's a syntax error if you that, that we're tying into something that would have been a syntax error before but decorators have this funnier compatibility issue which is don't not it's not about breaking the web but more about breaking the ecosystem so because decorators are so widely used in their Babel and TypeScript forms, it's really important that we provide a, a working transition path so right. that decorators can support both the old and the new forms and the decorators themselves can detect how they're being used so that they can switch between the different forms. This is one of those kind of subtle, subtle goals that was uncovered during this process. And I, I think the current proposal solves it well. Awesome, glad to hear that. And uh, most of the people uh, who speak about uh, decorators uh, would also talk about uh, one of your other proposals on pipeline operation. So the pipeline operator has been uh, in, in uh, the same stage for a pretty long time. What's happening with that and where are we heading towards? It, it, it's funny because uh, many of these things that you're counting through, they're, they're things that I feel a bit guilty about because I want them all to happen, but they're not. They're not really happening as fast as I would hope. Anyway, um, the the pipeline operator, the pipeline operator is, I think, really important because it generalizes method chaining to functions. So it's really nice to be able to write code in JavaScript, like, you know, going back to jQuery where you have one object and then you call a method on it and you call a method on the result. So it's like x dot y, parentheses dot z dot a. And it just chains. It just, you know, that's your pipeline of operations. You could even use the word pipeline when, when talking about that. Yep. Uh, but the problem is that when you write code in that style, uh, everything has to um, be a method on the object. So they all have to be in the same namespace. One, one of the really nice things about JavaScript is that it's lexically scoped. So lexically scoped means that everything functions are just like variables there they exist within a scope and they, they can be local they can be global but with modules you have different lexical scopes in each module so each module can export some functions and you can compose different modules together without them stomping on each other the way that you stomp on each other if everybody writes into the same prototype to make the method chaining work yep. so the pipeline operator lets you chain different functions together instead of chaining different methods together. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's quite valuable to promote more modular code. Mm -hmm. However, there are multiple alternatives, all of which have different disadvantages to how the pipeline operator could work. It's been really unclear to me how to facilitate a productive discussion there. Mm -hmm. Then a new alternative, well, maybe not that new, uh, but one alternative being proposed is that the pipeline operator work by, it's called the, the hack style. There, there are all these different alternatives. One is the hack style, one is the F-sharp style, one is the Elixir style. That was sort of the jargon that, that developed in the, in the yep. development of this proposal. Yep. And so in the, in the hack style, everything you put in the pipeline has to have probably a question mark in it to say where the previous thing in the pipeline should go. Mm -hmm. You can find more details about this proposal in the, the pipeline operator repository at github.com slash tc39 slash proposal pipeline. And uh, I'm pretty optimistic about the hack approach. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more verbose. It's a little more, more explicit. And I think it's, you know, although this feature is a lot about being terse, it's, it's probably better to be explicit in general to avoid uh, things getting pretty ugly in certain cases. So we, we hope to bring pipeline back to committee soon under, under new management. I'm trying to leave the, the champion group mm -hmm. and yeah, it's, it's the kind of thing where even though this feature doesn't do a big thing, the day-to-day -day of just passing around data and calling functions is important to advance and become cleaner and more and more expressive, more directly expressive of what the programmer wants over time. 
definitely composing functions uh, is one of the uh, primordial attributes of uh, functional programming and uh, yeah people are looking forward for this proposal and definitely use the term guilt then i think it, it you should be super proud of all the proposal that you have brought into the committee and uh, i'm looking forward for uh, all of these to become reality sooner oh thanks uh, yeah, I do want to say maybe like a personal note about pipeline as someone who used to work on the factor programming language, where in factor, because you're using the stack, you don't need to use named variables. I was always very interested in, in pipeline because pipeline also reduces the need for named variables. At the same time, one of my big takeaways from factor is it's quite easy to go overboard in avoiding named variables. And you see this in places like the Haskell community as well, yep. where they get really into these point-free functions. And I think these can really make it a lot harder to understand code. What, what the pipeline operator does is make just one thing that you can pass around. Once you get into multiple different values that you're trying to thread through, it's, mm -hmm. it's really hard to understand what's going on. And I think at that point, it's best to just go back to variables. This was one of... My, my big lessons from Factor are mostly cautionary tales about errors that we made. And I want to avoid repeating those errors in, in the pipeline uh, approach. That was an awesome insight. Uh, you know, point free and uh, your code being referentially transparent would, would make it more effective. And uh, people would definitely love to uh, you know, code in that side. And there it might be certain set of people who are already into that mode, but it would be you know, one of the awesome powers that JavaScript would uh, eventually have. Well, point, point free and referentially transparent sort of have nothing to do with each other. Point free is, is a pretty superficial property just mm -hmm. about how you're phrasing the code and being, you know, referentially transparent or purely functional. That's a very deep property about always returning the same thing yeah. with the same arguments. Uh, there's been interest in having some kind of enforcement of referential transparency in JavaScript. I could definitely see how that would be useful. As, as a thing that you would opt into, but I can't imagine how that would work. Everything in JavaScript is constantly mutating everything. It, it's, a, it's a little bit of a, of a mess to go back and, but in, it's, it's, a, it's, it's difficult to go back and find this purely functional subset in strict terms, but in practical terms, it's also easy to program in JavaScript in a functional way. So it's kind of a funny contradiction. Yeah, more more of uh, uh, in a school of thought of Ramda or uh, immutable um, JS and likes, right? Um, with with that, Dan, uh, I normally end the uh, show with this question to uh, our guests on what is your uh, favorite TC thirty nine proposal and why? Well, yeah, talking about functional programming, my favorite proposal right now is the record and tuple proposal, championed by my my. Uh, colleagues in Bloomberg, uh, Rick Button and Robin Ricard. Records and tuples adds purely functional, deeply immutable objects and arrays to JavaScript or things that are like objects and arrays. And this makes it so that you can program with a lot more confidence when you're, when you're working with immutable data structures. You don't have to worry about deeply freezing them. You don't have to worry about passing them to somebody and then having them mutate it and then they pass it back. Yep. And I think it could be fairly efficient. I don't want to say that it will be more, I don't expect that it will be more efficient than objects and arrays. Uh, sometimes people think that just because it's immutable, it will suddenly be more efficient. But mm -hmm. um, I think it can, it can match them without the performance penalty that you get right now from doing object freeze. And the other thing about records and tuples is they're compared by value. So when you use triple equals comparing to two tuples, it will compare them element-wise. Mm -hmm. I think that will be pretty useful. Sebastian uh, Lorber wrote a really interesting article about how this could be useful in React. Yep. In various different scenarios, deep comparison is something that, that makes a lot of kind of everyday programming things easier to do. So really that's, that's besides, I mean, that and decimal, I'm also really excited about decimal. But those are, those are what I'm really looking forward to in JavaScript. Awesome. That was 
awesome to listen to Dan and I will definitely, uh, you know, um, link into your Twitter account uh, in the post to this podcast and all our listeners will pester you. Oh yeah, please pester me. Uh, happy to hear from you. And that was Daniel from Igalia. Hope you enjoyed the show.